Beautiful humans, happy Monday. Welcome to another episode of Embodied Impact, where we're exploring the intersection between entrepreneurship and really the sexual pleasure dimensions. So today we have the great honor to have Steve McGew with us again. Today we're really looking at the neurophysiology of, of orgasm. So Steve has been, I really love like the multifaceted background that you have from the tech world to uh, studying human sexuality and being an associate professor in that space. And yeah, really today bringing the, um, the combination really where you have brought together these two worlds in creating high to treat anorgasmia in women. And yeah, really looking at the three different types of, of orgasms that, that women can have. I'm gonna talk about multi-orgasmicness and how it shows up in men, how it shows up in women. And really looking at that Ultimately, the journey of pleasure is the destination of pleasure. So um, if you have any questions while we go along in the presentation, so Steve will share a number of, of slides and um, drop them in the question box at the bottom of the screen or here on the side in the chat and um, feel free to put them in there as well. And yeah, if you want to continue the conversation after that um, seminar is over, then when you click on join our community, you'll be able to, to join a WhatsApp group where yeah, we can interact more and, and discuss anything that has come up. All right, Steve, my man, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Tobias. I appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor again to be here um, and thank everybody. It's wonderful that you have an interest in this area. And one thing to tie this to the entrepreneurial area as well is uh, there's a guy named Price Pritchett who's written a bunch of very interesting books on business development. And he gives the analogy of watching a fly try to get out of a window, constantly banging out at the window, not realizing there's an open window 20 feet away. And but all the fly can see is that one perspective because it can't broaden its view. And you think, why can't this fly just fly out there? The point of sexuality is, uh, at least based on my experiences and observation, is by achieving certain states, you can actually allow more blood flow to your brain to allow you to access more parts of yourself. So if you're that fly, it might give you a glimpse of the other side. So, so this does tie directly into all of the major uh, historic um, uh, self-help books talk about sexuality and sexual drive in business. So it is definitely intertwined. Now, I'm going to go really fast here. So uh, my goal is to be done by a quarter till uh, the end of the hour. Um, so sorry if I make your head spin. I'm going to jam about a semester of stuff into... 45 minutes, but I want to give you some background so you can understand, you know, at the end. And then if there's time, we'll show a video and see if you can identify what type of orgasm this appears to be that the lady's having. So that being said, I will share the screen here and go with that. Or I will try to let's see here. Okay. And I'm thinking you can see this okay hopefully so again my goal is for you to learn how things work so you can apply it in your life um, one thing i want to emphasize in neuroscience uh, the people in research i worked in neuroscience research many many years ago and the people in research uh, realize we don't really truly know that much yet about what is going on we have uh, general direction but we're limited to the tools that we have for measuring things so uh, that's a long, complicated story, but I wanted to mention that. Um, also, several people have asked us why our viewpoint is different and what our background is. Uh, that's myself and my wife, Wendy. She unfortunately was tied up here this morning. But uh, our viewpoint is very different in sexology. Uh, most sexology studied third person past tense. And unless it's focusing on pathology or physiology, it's not studied. Uh, Bill Masters and Walter Pomeroy in the recent history and then later Virginia Johnson and Bill Math, well, Virginia Johnson and Bill Masters is the same person. Um, they started making significant inroads in live testing. What gave us a different perspective was we were able to observe orgasm real time, first person present tense uh, with this device that we invented accidentally. It's a long story about that. We reached out to many institutions, but uh, basically no one wanted to study real-time orgasm for the sake of pleasure. 
And I wanted to mention that because it's probably having an impact on your sex life right now with the cultural implications of that. And it's not even realized. But uh, this is actually when we were testing things live many years ago. Um, but uh, also, I wanted to emphasize that I'm only an observer of this uh, in reference to female experiences. Uh, I have observed this thousands of times, but uh, I can't truly say from the female perspective what is going on. And I respect that, and I respect that I may not understand. So, uh, but I just wanted to mention that is how our perspective is different, uh, going beyond the fact that I have the science background in those areas. But I wanted to start out with talking about what exactly an orgasm is, uh, because it's one of the most intense things we can experience, but it's just assumed and not talked about. Traditionally, for a long time, the male definition was used, which was face focusing on uh, physical characteristics, erection uh, and ejaculation. Uh, only in more recent history has a female definition become more widely used, uh, which is more combination of uh, psychological things combined with the contractions of the uterus and uh, anus and lower pelvic floor. Um, there's kind of a war going on between the definition as far as focusing on psychological states and perception versus physical uh, experiences. I think it's a combination of both, uh, but but that's what's currently going on with that. Um, also, until recently, women's sex drive has just flat out not been understood in the last 200 years. It may have been understood previously or acknowledged in mainstream culture. A huge change happened with uh, Marie Bonaparte. She was Napoleon's granddaughter. Um, she could achieve orgasm clitorally herself, but was not able to via intercourse in marriage. And she was good friends with Sigmund Freud in Austria. And Freud was the first person in modern history to present the, well, that can be debated, but uh, in, in the last couple hundred years to present the idea of sexual maturity in women, which was actually kind of misogynistic. Uh, but basically he had this idea that clitoral orgasms were the first type of orgasm and then women uh, with penetration would have a more mature orgasm with her partner. Um, that, that's a still hotly debated topic uh, and it was very sexist. Uh, but Marie took 243 women and divided them into three groups. Uh, the first group, uh, basically she measured the difference in distance between the clitoris and the vaginal opening. And one group had more than two and a half centimeters, one group had between one and two and a half centimeters, and one group had less than one centimeter as far as the difference in distance. And what she found in their reporting was the closer the clitoris is to the vaginal canal, the more likely the woman is to have orgasm. Now, is that clitoral or is that vaginal? But that's what she found. Um, Kinsey also found that women had uh, a lot higher of a sex drive than mainstream media initially wanted to talk about. The big difference was it was cyclic and it could dissipate very, very quickly. Um, we've seen that as well uh, many, many times. Uh, this was Kinsey, if you see the white area era there. And then this is Walder Pomeroy, who was his main research assistant. And he became the first dean at the IASHS later. Um, between the 50s and the 90s, most researchers downplayed the importance of vaginal stimulation uh, until Beverly Whipple uh, presented that with the rediscovery of the G-spot. Um, but our thought is it depends on each woman and it's actually really complicated. Um, we found that generally for women to achieve sexual fulfillment, however you wanna define that, they first have to feel safe and relaxed then they have to feel actual desire themselves and hopefully feel desired if they're with a partner. And then they have to receive the right stimulation. And those are three separate areas that all three need to be achieved if she's gonna be truly happy with things. Um, as far as the cycle for this that Kinsey and other people at the Kinsey Institute proposed, uh, they say it begins with desire for the women. It leads to arousal, which is swelling of the genitals, lubrication, uh, increased heartbeat. That leads to a state of excitement with more increased heartbeat, which then in women usually tends to maintain a plateau state for a certain period. Then if triggered high enough, it will result in orgasm, which is the spasm and the mental state. And then that goes to a uh, 
resolution where there's a refractory period, which can go back to desire and it can repeat or it can just stop at that one area there. That's the more modern adaptation of Masters and Johnson's model that, that has been expressed at the Kinsey Institute. Me, you're going to focus on the physical part um, and follow the path of orgasm from the genitals to the brain and then possibly back down. And to begin with that, there are four ways we can perceive touch. And I like to mention that up front because a lot of times we don't think about touch and uh, what it actually means. Um, but just consider what I'm about to say here in a moment. And another thing I want to mention is touch the physical act is is there is a physical act but what we're actually perceiving is what's going on in our head and i'll explain that in a minute as far as what's going on in our brain but the first area i'm not sure if you can see the mouse here moving around but the merkel cells can they say five to 15 hertz we begin at four hertz with that this is the first way that we receive that's about four times or five times per second going up to about 15 times per second uh, a wonderful technique called kunyaza from Africa has the male slap his, or the male body person slap his penis against the vulva uh, at that frequency. Then the next frequency up is vibration. Oh, I also wanted to mention the, the Ruffini corpuscles can detect rough, starting at about four hertz. These detect stretching. Then you have vibration that goes uh, up to about 50 hertz. And then you have higher speed vibration that goes up to 250 hertz. The problem with vibration, because that was found to be very successful with vibrators in the beginning in the, well, with Mortimer Granville in the late 1800s, is their pain receptors up here. And they actually are most effectively stimulated between 80 and 120 hertz or times per second. So the same thing that will give pleasure on the glands of the clitoris, uh, as long as those nerves are talking louder than your pain receptors, uh, you're going to enjoy it. But when they depolarize and you have your refractory period, this area has a much stronger uh, ability to keep going. And that's one of the big reasons that we have this don't touch me, you get away kind of response with, with women with clitoral stimulation. I wanted to mention that because these are four very different ways of providing stimulation. And, um, uh, you can do them separately or you can combine them together because what we found is you can combine multiple channels of stimulation simultaneously in the same area and you get a much, much, the sum is greater than the parts basically from that. And that's good to know. Um, for instance, kunyaza combined with vibratory stimulation or other types of stimulation um, produces a much, much more powerful response, at least based on our observations. Uh, I wanted to, and again, if your head's spinning, I'm sorry, uh, I just wanted to go through this stuff real quick before we got to the actual main topic. The, as far as the nerves and the pelvic area, previously, everybody focused on the pedendal nerve, which is in the glands of the clitoris, um, the crua, the whole area here. Then there's the pelvic nerve in the vaginal area, and that's also associated in the, the anal area, the peridium. The uh, hypogastric nerve is deeper in the vaginal canal. And then an area that is newer in the last 20 years that uh, Barry and Beverly pioneered at Rutgers, Barry Misrak and Beverly Whipple, is the vagus nerve that they showed that it actually went down to the cervix and the uterus. But other than the vagus nerve, all three of these nerves go through the sacral plexus, which is the first big distinction I wanted to mention um, to people. And we'll, we'll readdress the sacral plexus in just a moment. But as far as clitoral orgasms, there's stimulation of the glands and also the ligament, the suspensory ligament that can detect stretching. There's also a stimulation of the, uh, the corpus cavernosum and the, the areas, they're, they're different names depending on which person you talk to for these regions. But the, the clitoris is not just this structure here. This is analogous to the penis in the male. And these two areas become engorged with blood as well. Uh, stimulation at different frequencies, different styles of movement of this area can be very, very uh, beneficial for women because a lot of times there's just focus up here. But you can go at the slower speeds at four hertz, the vibratory stimulation, um, suction, which produces a different response I didn't talk about, and then percussion. 
um, which produces a very, very different response. As far as the uh, vaginal canal, um, the G spot, which Beverly Whipple made famous later, is roughly uh, one to possibly three centimeters inside the vaginal canal facing upward. Then the A spot, which is the anterior fornix, is right above the head of the cervix. Then the O spot is behind the cervix. And then you have the cervix itself, which is right here. These are all different regions that uh, produce slightly different responses. It varies from woman to woman. And uh, there's a process you have to go to go through to really um, get the most of that experience. But but I wanted to mention these areas. Then there's the perineum, which is between the vaginal opening and the anus. And then there's the anus. Um, the, all of these areas, other than this area right here, are talking via the pelvic, uh, pedendal, and hypogastric nerves. The vagus nerve goes up here. And there's an important distinction. We'll explain in just a minute about that. We found that basically relaxing the path between the genitals and the brain, relaxing the muscles where the nerves go, and strengthening those pathways is, is one of the foundational critical things to help women that have difficulty with orgasm, as well as helping women become multi-orgasmic, as well as men. Um, but what exactly am I talking about there? Because, you know, I'm just putting text up here. Uh, how does this signal get to the brain? Well, if you're looking from the rear, the genitals are in here. Uh, but actually, all the nerves that come from this region merge in this area. This is called the sacral plexus, which is in inside the buttocks on each side. Also, your uh, sciatic nerve goes down here as well. Um, but this is actually a critical point based on our experiences um, because all of the data, other than the vagus nerve, is going through these nodes. Nerves have an interesting thing that these are kind of like little mini processors and there, there are many different nodes in our bodies where nerves combine together and they kind of have crosstalk. And uh, assuming there's time when we show the video of the woman experiencing orgasm, I, I want you to think about that as far as the crosstalk going on here because you'll see leg shaking and that is a secondary signal that appears from the, the signal here. But we found the massaging this area can really help with a variety of challenges that women have. We're not making any medical claims about this, but that's been our observation from personal experience. Looking at this closer, massaging this area in particular, and we'll show a photo of it, um, is a great thing to do before you do pelvic massage in women. Um, this is using the high unit. The vibe guide allows it to align, align properly to target that region uh, very well. So I wanted to mention that. The next thing, you know, so we've got the signal going here and it's going up to the brain. Uh, the next thing is, you know, you've got this whole pathway here. These nerves are actually parasympathetic or relaxatory nerves that are going to the pelvic area. But this area, if it becomes tense, there's right in this area, there's something called the lumbar plexus, which the upper nerves, the hypogastric nerve goes through that. And if you have severe muscle spasm in this area, it just really messes things up. Um, so relaxing that area in the back can help profoundly for getting the signal going up to the brain. Also, uh, what we'll touch on here in a second for the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve comes out of the neck on each side here. If you have severe tension in your neck muscles, which most people do from working at a computer and looking down at their phone, they don't even realize it you're actually impeding the blood flow and the function of that nerve. So it's kind of like you've got a volume control on your nerves. And when you are tense here or here or here, you're turning your volume down low. And even if you're wanting to experience that sensation, you're not going to be able to as well. So that's something that's worth mentioning um, as well. Now, as far as orgasm for women, they're two very different pathways. The traditional clitoral and surface vaginal vulval stimulation, outer vaginal, uh, is associated with the spinal nerves. Um, going up, looking up here again, what most people associate with orgasm with clitoris is going through the spine, through these nerves here. Now, the vaginal nerve, the vaginal orgasm or the deep cervical stimulation, um, 
that actually is going via a different path, at least according to what Barry Commissarat was able to show. And I'll, I'll show you what he found here in a moment. Um, and I'll also explain why that's a big deal. Basically, the clitoral stimulation that's going up this way, um, if you have cervical stimulation, this chart doesn't really show it well. In fact, it probably makes it confusing. You have these two nerves that go out on each side, and they're separate from the spine. Um, one branch of it mainly focuses on stuff above the diaphragm where you breathe. The other branch goes below, and that branch affects your kidneys, your bladder, and men to a very minor degree. It's crosstalk to the penis, but not much at all really there. And then to the uterus in particular is what Barry found. The reason what the reason that got Barry and Beverly uh, studying this, uh, Barry was already studying orgasm in the brain, but Beverly had several uh, gynecological patients that were, had complete spinal cord cuts from injuries. So they had no feeling down here but they claimed they could have an orgasm if their partner stimulated them the right way vaginally. So they actually had them go in, put them in a functional MRI and stimulate them. And even though they could not feel their clitoris, they could not feel their vulva, their legs, they had sensation of orgasm in their mind. And that's, uh, that's a very, very interesting thing that got Barry on that path. But this is a very different pathway, which we'll explain from the, this lower pathway. As far as clitor clitoral orgasms, most people think that's what most people think they are. And as I said, they're faster. They're usually more intense. Uh, they're focused in the pelvic area, not the full body sensations some women describe. Many times there's a longer refractory period between orgasms where they either don't want to be touched because of sensitivity or they just have lost the, the interest in, in being touched. Um, that is very common with the clitoral orgasm, particularly with vibratory stimulation. Another very interesting thing we found is there appears to be a left and right side for the nerve path. Um, and it looks like they've seen that in some cat now or in some fMRI studies. But basically, you've got nerves on each side of your body coming down. And, uh, and that's something that we've observed. Another interesting thing about clitoral organ orgasms that uh, Nicole Prouse talked about here several years ago is they tend to be more influenced by mental state by looking at erotic images and things of that nature whereas we found that deep uh, vaginal cervical and possibly abdominal stimulation is not as associated with the mental states and that's very interesting to us for some other reasons but i wanted to mention that uh, now vaginal or uterine orgasms uh, originally, the Greeks, going back to Hippocrates, thought that was the only orgasm there was. Um, it's involving stimulating the deep interior, the vaginal canal, the cervix. Uh, in our case, we found abdominal stimulation. Barry and Beverly found it was the distal branch of the vagus nerve. If this guy's, if again, if I'm making your head spin and you're like, oh, Lord, um, just stick with me. We'll get to more interesting stuff here soon. Um, it's associated with lower frequency stimulation. We've never seen things above 10 hertz produce a response, which is kind of interesting. Um, women have very, very short refractory periods between orgasms. We've literally seen women have more than 12 orgasms in succession where they're just rolling and they have a mild break for five or 10 seconds and then it keeps going. Um, so that's, that's a very, very interesting difference. Uh, it can be associated with no pleasure or pain. And that's another thing we're gonna mention here in a few minutes. Uh, the mapping of this pathway can be associated with either no sensation at all, or it can be associated with pain, or it can be associated with pleasure. And there is a process you can go through um, with time to move away from, from displeasure or no sensation to go towards pleasure. That's a whole another topic, but it can be done. The orgasm from deep vaginal and cervical uh, uterine orgasms, most women describe as being more intense over the entire body. It, it's not as focused and intense as the clitoral. It's more like a wave that flows over large parts of their body, and it causes them to kind of zone out or escape themselves more than the clitoral orgasm. 
regular general practice uh, definitely will strengthen this pathway, uh, particularly if you relax the neck areas and go through certain processes, their, their pathways and, and procedures that we've developed for that. Uh, Debbie Heinrich talked about a corgasm, which is kind of what led us on our path, uh, where women doing crunches and all claim they could feel vaginal orgasms. I completely believe that's possible um, because our external abdominal laboratory stimulation in certain women can cause that. Now, I've talked about the clitoral orgasm. I've talked about the vaginal orgasm. And I've talked about the path going up to the brain. But what happens once it gets to our brain? Well, as I said, we don't truly understand what's going on with the brain and we're limited by some very primitive tools. Uh, 100, 500, 1,000 years from now, hopefully we'll have a much better understanding. But I've broken the brain down into three parts, me, myself, and I. Basically, it appears we experience orgasm states at all three of these levels, but our perception of it um, is in the highest level where we have a feeling of loss of self. Um, now, you can experience the orgasm just as a physical contraction in the genital region that doesn't have much impact on the higher parts of our thinking, which that's not nearly as, as pleasant, um, but that, that is possible as well. And that's why I wanted to mention these three separate areas. But basically, our most primitive part of us is our reptilian brain. This area controls our heartbeat, our keeping us alive, basically, doing all that stuff. I call that I. Then we have our mammalian brain or the limbic system, which is fancier. This is where emotions, this is where all of our sensory input coming from here is filtered first and decided if it's real or not, it's stored. Um, then we have the very fancy cerebral cortex above here. This is the me. This is the part that's actually listening to and aware of this talk I'm giving right now. So you have me up here, you have myself, and then you have I. And all three of these things are playing together. Although this area is not conscious, it responds only by blood flow and metabolic activity. Um, this area is heavily influenced by blood flow and metabolic activity as well, but it's more of a data processor, it appears. This is where, and particularly up here, is where the magic in us being self-aware appears to be going on um, with the current opinions. The reason I wanted to mention that is as far as experiencing stuff in your genitals, you know, I said it's in your genitals, then it goes up your spine. This area called the postcentral gyrus on each side, this is showing one lobe of the brain. This is where we feel or at least we believe we feel in our consciousness, all of our body sensations. It's called the somatosensory cortex. It's positioned right beside the part of our brain, the motor cortex or the precentral gyrus that controls our movement. So when you want to move something, this area of the brain right beside it feels the sensory input of what's going on. Um, your awareness of who you are is sitting up here. And it's getting data from this area saying what's going on with our body with movement and touch. Now, a guy named Penfield uh, did surgery on someone's brain for epilepsy and he used, he had their skull open. They had to be conscious and he would use an electrical electrode and touch different parts of their brains and ask them, what did they feel? And it's hard to read this, but when they touched down low, they felt the, abdominal area, and then a little bit higher, they felt the, the pharynx, then the tongue, a little bit higher, uh, teeth, lips, going all up the different aspects of the body. And the genitals were up at the top, up here mostly. And this was originally mapped for men, but, uh, but that's basically for the past, what is it, 30 years? I may be wrong about the date. That is how long we have been focusing on this part of our brain and that's been assumed what's going on and originally everything was associated to be coming from the spine the vagus nerve had nothing to do with it in women what uh barry commissarek found was now this is looking straight down on the woman's head so this is the right lobe this is the left node uh, lobe of the head this is controlling 
her movement. This is her thinking about, I want to move my hand. I want to, you know, do whatever. This is secondary echoes of that, it appears. These areas are mapping to the, the vaginal area, the cervix in the middle, and the clitoris. Um, this is what Barry was able to show before Beverly came along with the spinal cord cut patients. He found that finger movement was way out here. Then, interestingly, nipple movement, nipple stimulation was in the sexual area as well, but it also had stimulation in other parts of the brain. Uh, the clitoris he found again, the vaginal area and the cervix. Um, this is all through mapped through this old school model. Um, he also found, now I'm jumping ahead of myself with the vagus nerve, as far as how people describe things, the spinal nerves, the pedendal, pelvic, and hypogastric were localized uh, in the vaginal area. It was deep heaving and it was mixed if it had multiple stimulation. But when it was only the vagus nerve, and we'll show that in a minute, there was a much more, some women described a shower of stars, the most intense feeling of losing themselves and things associated with spiritual sensations. Women describe that more so from the vagus, and that could be talking to the hypogastric nerve and the pelvic nerve as well. But, but the women that had the spinal cord cut injuries was what started him on this pathway. Um, again, if you look, these are the spinal nerves other than the vagus nerve that I've talked about. What Barry found when women had spinal cord injuries was part of their brain stem lit up. And they described erotic pleasure. And as it progressed, the part of their brain that was associated with uh, basically cervical stimulation lit up very soon after. And they described the sensation of orgasm, even though their spinal cord was completely cut. So he pr produced this map to try to explain things. But the point here is he was able to show repeatedly with spinal cord injury women that that pathway can work. And, uh, but the thing is you have to strengthen it over time. That has been our experience. This also just, uh, for, you know, for the sake of showing it, this is a woman beginning self-stimulation. The lighter the colors are, the more blood flow and activity are going on. The area that's associated with sensory stimulation lights up. It gets lighter, lighter, way lighter, lighter, then this is probably the climax, and then it returns. But that's showing how even though the sensory stimulation is in this region, it causes a massive change over the entire brain. It's almost like control alt delete on a computer or reboot. And uh, that can have a lot of benefits for women and for men. So I wanted to mention that first, as far as the differences, because a lot of people associate uh, orgasms with clitoral stimulation alone, or, and they assume that vaginal stimulation is tied to clitoral stimulation. And uh, I believe they're two separate pathways, but they can be experienced together. Barry also showed, and it's interesting because I was running in parallel with this, uh, while Barry was, uh, um, doing these things, I was mapping the surface areas of the vagus nerve to Masters and Johnson's Sensate Focus Technique, but they knew that this part of the ear was tied to a little branch of the vagus nerve, so they created a device that could stimulate that, and then they had a control device women would put on to see, and what they found was basically the cervix lit up. Now, another interesting thing they found was they could simulate the nipple with this and produce very interesting results. Uh, it's usually oops, it's usually associated, um, the, the nipple is tied into, what is it, cervical four, um, uh, the nerve in the middle part of the spine, which is uh, believed to be sympathetic and not associated with that pathway, but something clearly is affecting this area. And I, I personally believe there is a little branch of the vagus nerve going into the breast and the nipples. Um, but I just wanted to mention the, uh, the, how they came up with these ideas. Um, this is showing the technique that we use for ear stimulation for a massage technique called intimacy massage, where I took Masters and Johnson's sensate focus technique, which was for anorgasmia, and I mapped it to where I believed the vagus nerve was going 
and it produced a much more powerful response. Uh, also, to not leave the guys out, when men self-stimulate, now it's interesting it didn't show activity um, for the arm, for the hand, but uh, I'm assuming that was uh, self-stimulation. But the same area that's roughly around the clitoris um, and the vaginal area lights up in men in the brain. So I wanted to include men in this as well. Now, for vaginal and I've got to repeat my slide here. Basically, they used to believe that that was the only true orgasm. Um, and uh, frankly, they were wrong. But, uh, but again, I've mentioned this before. Uh, I'll skip through this. Now, one thing I wanted to mention here, and I'm going to jump through the rest of this real fast, then we'll answer questions and talk about the main topics, uh, is why do some women experience pain, but others experience pleasure? Uh, some women have vaginismus, which is an involuntary contraction of the vaginal canal. Some women have vulvodynia, which is a generalized inflammation that can be very, very painful. Um, frequently, women have no feeling or pleasure from penetration, whether it's manual penetration with a phallic device or intercourse. Um, so why is that? Uh, usually, we believe, based on our experience, and now working with several thousand women and with couples, is many times when women don't have pleasure from vaginal stimulation, their first experience of penetration was traumatic. It could have been a, a gynecological exam. It could have been a ta tampon. It could have been sexual assault. Um, the same mechanisms that happen with PTSD um, appear to be expressing themselves with pelvic pain. And that's something that, uh, that we re really wanted to mention because sadly, anywhere between 20% to 35 or more percent of women in the Western world and probably more all over the world have experienced sexual assault and trauma and they just don't talk about it. It's very, very unfortunate and it's rampant. And I hope this, we can stop as a culture and species for this, but, but that plays a major, major role in reducing women's ability to experience pleasure later in life because that traumatic experience is just locked in. Now there are ways to deal with it. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. Now to get to finally what I was talking about uh, in the introduction, the three main types of orgasms, the clitoral, ejaculatory, and vaginal or cervical, which I've talked a lot about the nerves here. And we'll mention other types, which I think are grouped in here. The clitoral orgasm is usually from stimulation of the glands or the cruis, rubbing and stretching motions. We found four hertz seems to be the magic number with the high unit. Our percussion began at four hertz. That's also the same frequency as kunyaza typically begins with the slapping motion. Um, four, eight, 12 hertz going in those jumps for whatever reason tends to give the best response. But that's what most women are familiar with, with clitoral orgasm. They're several different techniques. We go through about eight manual finger techniques you can use for manual stimulation. Um, another thing I wanted to mention real quick was women are affected by the same vascular issues as men. Uh, a lot of men are affected by ED beginning about 40 in the Western world. Um, unfortunately, women, these areas are very similar to the penis, but the blood vessels are about one tenth the diameter. And women beginning in their 30s start getting arteriosclerosis in these regions as well. And that prevents these regions from expanding. It reduces sensation. It reduces lubrication. And uh, a lot of times it's associated with menopause and poor tissue health. And it's actually a vascular condition that um, is a dangerous warning sign because it will affect your heart, potentially cause a stroke, et cetera. But that can be addressed with uh, dietary and lifestyle changes. But I wanted to mention that because that's not usually talked about. Now, ejaculatory orgasms or squirting with women. Uh, I want to mention as far as this is the clitoris, this is the labia minora or the smaller lip, the urethra where urine comes out. You can see one of the skein's glands. There's another one hidden on this side, uh, Bartholin's glands or a secondary one. But as far as ejaculation, it appears to be a combination of dilute urine and fluid from the skein's glands. The skein's glands uh, produce a white milky fluid that is very similar to uh, semen uh, in men. 
it contains prostate specific antigen, which is an antigen that activates sperm and makes it more modal. Um, there have been different, only two studies I'm aware of really focusing on this. Usually it results from both clitoral stimulation and penetration, although Kinyaza can be very, very effective at that. Kinyaza is an African technique that is specifically for inducing uh, female ejaculation. Uh, with high, we have a technique specifically for that. But basically the first study that was done was in 1999 at the IASHS, and they focused mainly on, on Skeen's glands. And they said that there was a, a great deal of PSA. And they were convinced ejaculation was coming from here with a tiny amount of urine leaking out. A study in France was done, I think in 2014, with I believe seven women, and they did an ultrasound of their bladder before, and then they had them void their bladder to see that it was empty. Then they had their partner stimulate them. They did an ultrasound halfway through and they found the bladder filled very quickly. And then when the woman had the ejaculation, they did an ultrasound again and they found the bladder was empty and they took samples of the fluid and they found it was a com combination of very, very dilute uh, urine, very dilute urine, interestingly, and PSA. And the PSA and the Skeen's glands materials varied from woman to woman. Now, what's going on there? We don't truly know the mechanism. It appears to be wired the opposite way men are wired because in men, when they ejaculate, the internal urethral sphincter clamps shut and the prostate sphincter opens. We don't know, but that phenomenon happens. Women often describe this as being more intense than a clitoral orgasm, but it's, uh, it's not the end of the world if you don't experience it, but there are techniques you can, um, you can, explore to increase your odds for that. Now for vaginal penetration, we've already talked about this. You can have stimulation here in the G spot, the A spot, the O spot, or the cervix. As women become uh, more comfortable with these sensations, we found a thrusting motion that strikes here and presses on the cervix and then pulls up and pulls out slightly with a finger or a device or with penile techniques produces the best response. But this is a, a process you have to go through to experience this. That is the vaginal or the cervical orgasm. And that, when you have stimulation here, is most heavily associated with vagus nerve signal. And it also, when women achieve this orgasm, uh, they oftentimes describe it as being the most it's sometimes not as intense as the shorter orgasm here, but it's longer, it's more full body, it's flowing, and they have a much uh, more sense of loss of themselves, of their consciousness. And that has a lot of very interesting benefits, both for expanding your, your mind and as well, somehow that impacts if there's a male or a female present, um, it, in, it affects them and helps them become more responsive. Uh, now, people talk about anal, nipple, and mental orgasms. I think they are subsets of what we talked about. I may be wrong. Um, for high, because people have asked, what can that do? These are the three different positions above and below the pelvic bone. We hit everything there. This is below the pelvic bone. This is intensely stimulating for the pelvic floor. This is abdominal massage that uh, some women can achieve abdominal or uterine orgasm directly, although most women have to have orgasms in one of the earlier two positions for three or four orgasms, and then they move up here quickly. Um, that's what we do. Now, as far as the benefits, uh, why don't we switch back to, I actually stayed on target. Wow. Um, let me switch back to uh, our main screen here. I hope I didn't, <laughs> I went really fast. Um, uh, do you want me to share this screen or just we can answer these questions now that people... Um, yeah, maybe let's, let's step into this um, since, since Lynn and, and Berta are really enjoying the presentation. And okay. so Berta is asking, um, what are the eight kinds of stimulation? For finger techniques, um, basically you have... Uh, I've got a silicon model upstairs, but uh, that might be too graphic for them. Um, basically, if this is the, uh, <laughs> I should have brought that down actually. Um, um, but uh, basically you have one finger technique on the side, rubbing up and down, and that can be on either side. That is usually associated with uh, 
the original one taste methodology where they they focused on that um that is only actually well you're getting both sides but that's stimulating one side then you have two fingers going up and down for that then you have two fingers going in a interesting yeah we could do that um be much easier to, to for me to get my silicon model um we have Catherine and Richard, our two silicon models upstairs. But uh, um, then you have two fingers going up and down. That's the second technique. Then you have one finger circling around the hood of the clitoris, not directly on the clitoris. Then you have two fingers circling around the hood. Then you have a much wider circling to encompass the uh, uh, the crua uh, on the, the sides. Um, then you have a, uh, and that'd be what, five, six. Then you have a technique where you pull up and that's actually stretching this. Is, it's, there's a Japanese word called plucking the cherry. Um, uh, that's actually pulling on the suspensory ligament that produces a different sensation. Um, then you have the sucking techniques or the sucking motions that are involved with that. So if I counted and remembering that right, um, that would be the, so one finger, two fingers, two fingers, actually two fingers, tight circle around the clitoris. That's usually too intense. Then a uh, larger sensation going around. Um, you can have that going down too on the sides. And then you have a plucking out this way and a plucking up this way. And you can do that with one hand or two hands combining those techniques. Um, it's kind of like chewing gum and patting your head and all of it. But it's, uh, in fact, when we, uh, when we teach intimacy techniques, we want people first to learn hand massage because we want them to be able to use a technique where they look at what they're doing, but they also, through their peripheral vision, see their partner's face, see their partner's belly breathing. It's called soft eye. And then you can adjust because if the partner's grimacing in pain, you need to figure that out immediately. But if you're focused laser just on what you're doing, you're not going to. So you learn hand massage, for learning touch, but then you also learn to read your partner. Then we do the intimacy massage, which does not include genital contact. It includes nipple contact in males and females. Um, and then we actually do the physical techniques, you know, for external, which are, you know, with fingers primarily. Um, and then we do the internal vaginal techniques and the vaginal techniques are, there are a whole host of those things. Um, for women that have experienced trauma or just either have pain or have uh, um, no sensation, working with a partner where every Saturday they just get a vaginal massage and the outcome is not orgasm. The outcome is first just breathing and relaxing and feeling what touching and movement in each area does, starting out very slowly, very gently. Um, and there are different types of movements. Uh, again, we found that four hertz for whatever reason I've read some papers or some theories out there, but something with a data rate to our brain or how packets are dropped, I don't know. Because we got 4 billion bits of data coming in and we're only getting 4,000 to our consciousness to that little band there. So hitting it, starting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, the Kanyaza technique. Uh, and that actually, I didn't include that in the eight techniques. That is where the male, the woman's legs are wide and the male slaps the vulva. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And if the male has erectile dysfunction, he can still do that. You can do it erect or not. In fact, it's a little bit easier if you're partially erect than being completely erect. Um, that usually takes eight to 12 minutes. Um, another big thing is when you have percussion, lower than four hertz doesn't work. With the high unit, we started at four hertz. Most percussive massagers start at eight. That's real hard from an electrical engineering standpoint to get things going slower unless you have a big motor. Um, but we did that specifically because four hertz is the what appeared to be the starting point. Um, uh, stimulation of nipples and other parts of the body offset by one. So stimulate, 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 stimulate uh, seems to be more effective than simultaneous stimulation. That's another thing we found in, in working with people. Um, why that is, I don't know. And is that the case always? That may just be the fluke that we have seen but we've seen that a bunch of times because we taught this at some resorts and locations um so so again th those are the eight techniques so sorry um now let's see sir yeah i could do a chart uh uh thank you 
for the presentation. Now, as far as the other things, um, the multi-orgasm states in women, our observation is women can be clitorally multi-orgasmic, but usually there is a 30 to 60 second uh, refractory period between orgasms. With the high unit, it can be much shorter. If you have this above the, pel the pelvic bones here, this is stimulating the uterine, the, the, the G-spot area. This is stimulating the uh, mons pubis on the clitoris. This initially we recommend not turning on, on at all because women want to arrange that and focus their attention there. And what needs to be is aligned here. Once you get the right alignment and you're going about four, four or six hertz, then speed it up to however fast the woman wants. If it's aligned right, she'll have an orgasm very quickly. Then turn that down to four hertz or turn it off and have the vibe guide going. Let that go for 10, 15 seconds and then fire this up again. Um, and you can induce three, four or more orgasms. What we found is after women become very familiar with this, with the orgasm in this position and this position, if you give usually about three orgasms is the amount needed. If the women don't experience this by default, then move it up very quickly right above the pelvic bone and press down. And that sends a shock wave directly into each side of the uterus. Not in every woman, but in about eight out of 10 women in our experience, our limited, well, it's a couple thousand people, but it's our, our, our experience, um, uh, that will keep the uterus contracting and that can continue for a long time. You can do that with, uh, oh, the guy, this is a, a high massager. We discovered this by accident, trying to soften tissue adhesions from C-section surgery and it induced orgasms as a side effect. So that's why I'm here basically a long crazy story but uh but for multiple orgasms because believe me i was in i was in neuroscience and i was in the tech industry and this and i'm a geek uh, <laughs> i'm a i'm a geek's geek so I, I would never have thought i'd be in this this arena but it's fascinating um the uh becoming multi-orgasmic somehow changes women's mental state of being based on our observation you women look different. They act different. Um, you don't have to achieve that. You don't have to achieve an orgasm. Um, as I say, the journey, the destination is the journey. Don't focus on achieving orgasm. Focus on achieving experience and see where that experience and sensation takes you. My, my, my graduate research was in anorgasmia in women. And what we found with high was they, if the women were told this is for pelvic massage to get you ready for later for when you do orgasmic stuff and they didn't think anything about any goals of orgasm and said, you need to just feel this for how this feels on your pelvic muscles. Usually they just have orgasms. in. But if we told them this was specifically for orgasms, then they had the mental block. And that's the key thing. Clitoral stimulation. This can do both. But clitoral stimulation appears to be much more heavily influenced by our consciousness based on some of the later studies and based on our observation versus vaginal stimulation. But um, that's when, now the other topic, uh, anorgasmia in women, um, that is a, that is a journey to go through. And there are many things that have caused challenges with that. It can be simply, you've never had that experience before, or you had a traumatic experience and, and you're associating something traumatic that pops up in that you know, I say me, myself, and I. Well, if something in the I and myself thinks this is a threat, I mean, Betty Dodson, we were blessed to be able to hang out with her a few times and talk quite a bit and, and email for, I guess, a couple of years. She passed away. Um, she, her notion was that when babies are first just feeling their bodies, they touch their genitals, they're like, whoa, what's that? The mother or the father, who is God, who is everything to the baby, is like, Ugh, don't do that and move their hand away. The baby doesn't even have language. It's restore. It's storing data in these in the eye and the, you know, my you know, myself area. So it learns this is bad before it even has language. So if you have a block there, that there's a lot of work for that. But it is possible. It can be done. Uh, replay Kundalini energy. I talked about uh, Kundalini in the first talk, or at least my understanding of it. I believe with Kundalini and with I did Taoist yoga, um, learning to control your urogenital diaphragm and your pelvic floor diaphragm and your upper diaphragm with 
having flexibility in your spine and movement combined with breathing moves uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And moving that cerebral spinal fluid, I believe, is the physical analog of what people are describing with kundalini sensations. That combined with a pre-orgasmic or semi-orgasmic or multi-orgasmic, depending on how, how, what words you want to use, Barry Commissarac and some others were able to show that when we have orgasm or we get close to orgasm, we release oxytocin. Oxytocin in our blood does one thing, but when it gets in our spinal fluid, it actually activates the sympathetic nerves and that causes pupil dilation that causes facial flushing. And I think the release of certain types of neurotransmitters into our cerebral spinal fluid combined with the right learned mental techniques is what is that. I think the Indian culture was describing something that hopefully in my lifetime, we'll figure out looking at it from a very primitive Western standpoint, what actually is, but that's some very powerful stuff. It's amazing. Um, and maybe this also connects with what you were saying earlier, um, orgasm being a reset for the brain. Maybe we can quickly tap into this before we are uh, wrapping up the session. Sure. Um, well, uh, Barry mentioned, Barry Misrak mentioned that it, 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 if you showed a neurologist a strong orgasm and you showed somebody a seizure, a lot of times they can't tell the difference. And basically it just, it lights everything up and then it causes a reset. And the reason that can be beneficial, especially when you are posing a question right before you achieve that state, if you say, how is it that I've done this, assuming you've done it, and then you go through that state, your brain resets and that question's still there. And just talking about it like at the beginning, the little fly that couldn't get out the window, maybe you'll notice some other opportunity or alternative. Um, so that's... That's one. Now, for multi-orgasmic men, it's different from women, and that again is controlling those three diaphragms, and it's a learned process where you almost ejaculate, or you might have a contraction of the prostate but not release. Um, that can keep the man in a sustained ultra-heightened state, and it's also great for continuing to stimulate the woman through intercourse and other areas. But uh, I don't think guys have the scope of capacity for experiencing what women appear to have. Women can lead the way with that, though, because when women do become multi-orgasmic with their partner, it has an impact on their partner. That's very positive. And so that's, uh, I think I answered up. Let's see. Any literature that you, you know, that's a good point. I'll, I'll think about that and I'll make a list of stuff. Amazing. So, uh, the, the little, do you want to share this in the in the community group then? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, Betty has a wonderful book on body sex that came out. Um, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, I've got my shelf upstairs of books that uh, uh, a lot of the modern literature is, um, you know, I'll, actually, I'll need to think about that. Taoist Secrets of Love, everything that Montauk Chia has written. Um, uh, Taoist Secrets of Love. Uh, uh, the healing Tao, you know, everything he's written is, I, my Tai Chi teacher gave me that, I think when I was 11. Yeah. And then mm. I really got into it at 13. I started studying Tai Chi at eight and, uh, that stuff is, and that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to find out what, what does that relate to actual physical sensations that I can feel and where that might that correlate to science that, you know, is attempting to understand it. So I think a lot of what's described as metaphysical and spiritual are actually physical sensations. And uh, if you can look at it from that way and experience the sensation, but the key distinction there is, and I talked about this in the last talk, it's like shining a flashlight. The, the light of the flashlight, if you can't see this cup because it's dark and you shine a flashlight on it, you have the opportunity to see it. A lot of people get lost focusing on the light. It's the cup you need to notice. So when you're using techniques to notice things in your body. You're focusing your attention in your body, but don't get lost thinking that that focus of attention is what it is. It's to get you to notice something, a slightly different sensation in your body, because once you can feel it, then you can enhance it. And that's the thing with orgasm, not only relaxing, like we talked about relaxing behind the, the neck for the vagus nerve, going down the lumbar plexus on the lower back and the sacral plexus, that helps relax those pathways getting ready getting ready to achieve this stuff for the pelvic stimulation so uh 
I hope that answered that question. I'm not sure. How can you get in touch with me? Um, if you go to uh, uh, highmassager.com, um, I think there's a contact thing. And uh, how can we heal the physical body to align with the energy? I'm talking about. I would, uh, let me make sure I understand this question. And first of all, let me say, I, I so respect and honor you for just being open and talking about these things because our culture has made it so hard, particularly for women to, to guys get the cop out that they can say they can't help it or whatever, but women have been so repressed. And uh, um, I would say with your partner, um, Take things very, very slowly um, and respectfully of each other. And li like the intimacy massage program, we have uh, Masters and Johnson's Sensate Focus Technique. Um, like with intimacy massage, one technique I, I call follow the goosebump, where you stimulate certain areas, which is mainly vagus nerve surface stimulation. And your partner notices where a goosebump form forms on your rear, or your hip or your lower back. And then they very carefully stroke where the goosebumps are. And if they stroke it right, you can actually cause a feedback loop and produce goosebumps up here. Or sometimes it produces goosebumps somewhere else. And I call it follow the goosebump by the receiver just breathing and relaxing, feeling what their partner is doing and telling their partner what feels good, what doesn't feel good, and trusting their partner is not going to do anything that they don't want. Then the partner focusing on how they're, the, the giver focusing on how the receiver is breathing and relaxing doing the techniques. So you stroke here, you notice if there are goosebumps on the rear, you stroke the rear. You notice if goosebumps form back here or if goosebumps form on the thigh, you stroke those. And the receiver focuses on that. We found people can more than double their sensation, their ability to be, for this part of the brain, to be aware of touch. And that allows them later to, to experience much, much more. And then there are processes you can go through, um, which we don't have with online training that, uh, I'd like to get um, that that deal with penetration in all of those areas. But it each person is truly unique. Um, so we all have our own path. So I just I respect you for finding the path that that's that you're meant for. And you'll find it. Just keep looking. If I answered that right. I'm not sure. Did that make sense? Yeah, that was just saying that it would be great to have a book so people can have a better life. I'll have like, to write like shared, brother. Maybe I'll write a book about yeah, because we Wendy and I've noticed things that uh like the nipples. I was talking with Barry about that six years ago. Um, and then later he did fMRI and it does light up. I, I'm convinced we've noticed a bunch of stuff that is not documented. The sacral plexus, the lumbar plexus for for uh, uh, a whole host of urogenital things in, in men and women, um, the timing sequences, uh and and all of that so so yeah um, i'll i'll have to after that's well we have a youtube channel it's uh uh youtube.com slash c slash women and couples um on that uh and i hope to get more regular videos put out with that but uh but and and then you know the method I, oh another thing i wanted to mention i'm going way past time uh uh jamie wheel has a wonderful book called Recapture the Rapture. I don't have it here with me. But in his book, I've had the, the wonderful coincidence of being able to chat with him lately. Um, he talks about techniques with sexual yoga. And he talks about the challenges of modern society and stress and just the, the nightmare we're all going through. And then he talks about ways to deal with that. And he goes into sexual techniques with that. He doesn't go into great detail with it, but he might, that would be a book you might want to check. Now that's not an easy read. It's not for, it's not something you're going to sit down and read in 30 minutes. Um, it's a, it's a pretty thick, pretty dense book, but it'll give you some interesting, yeah, we capture the rapture. Um, he also has a, a camp every summer and then in the fall that, that he has. So he's done some, he worked with Steve Kotler with the flow project and things of that nature. So that would be a good book to mention. I'm glad that out of that. But, uh, and again, I normally go into far more detail. This is like a semester's worth of stuff. So, uh, and, and, but I want people to understand that there is some science behind what, what we're talking about. The thing is like when I was in neuroscience research, I worked with, uh, 
a wonderful guy named Wei Ming, who was a cardiologist, but he also did traditional Chinese medicine. And, and we're looking at a microscope or this tool. And he said, you know, this is a tool that allows us to quantitatively see one thing, but there are 10 million other things there that this tool doesn't let us see and our eyes can't see. With our culture, we only focus on what we can measure and what we can define in Western culture. Um, so what I'm trying to find is, is, is a training wheels to map with sensations we can understand to what is, has been described in Asian cultures. Um, that's uh, in, in other cultures, any culture that's been around for a long time and has had writing usually describes the same stuff with the human condition. So yeah, Lynn, and there, there is a replay basically after like 15 to like 30 minutes on the same link that you're on right now, the replay will be um, accessible. And yeah, Nicole, I'm, 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 I, I think I'm genuine. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I, I was told I had to immediately stop this and put the crazy device away or it destroy my software company. So I had to retire from my software company 12 years ago. So it, uh, and that was because my wife, we lost our first child. That's what caused us to go down this pathway. And, um, uh, she said, if, uh, uh, you know, this was helping women and the VCs that I worked with didn't want it to be done. And she said, well, would we, would we wonder what would happen if we never do this? I'm like, yeah, but it'll destroy the company. He said, well, if our son had lived, what would he be more proud of government software and logistics or helping women, millions of women. So I retired the next week and, uh, it's not been an easy process. I can tell you that not as hard as what Betty Dodson's done, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, I've had it real easy compared to her, but. So yeah, um, let's, let's start wrapping it up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm, so I'm, for anyone who wants to um, get in touch with, with Steve, there's um, a link actually in the description of the event where you can get, get more into the whole like high massage universe. Um, and then also if you join the community, Steve is also part of the community, then we can continue this conversation. Um, yeah. In the aftermath. Yeah, the only thing I warn you about is I type the from the app from a computer. So if you ask me a question, I will send you a really long answer. I probably overwhelm people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like how can you type all that? It's like because I'm typing on my PC. But, uh, but yeah, and we can. Want to leave I, any any last words, Steve? Or are we just are we, thank you for having me here and for helping get this information out because I. Uh, we were blessed to have our daughter um, when we were told we'd never be able to have a child. And five years later, we have now I have a nine year old, wonderful daughter. And um, uh, I don't want her to grow up in a world with the crap women have to deal with. And by sharing this information and you guys becoming leaders and helping other people, I think it'll make a life better for her and for everybody. So thank you for what you guys are doing, too. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone for being here. Steve, thank you so much for all the effort and the wisdom you shared. Well, thank you to be us. I appreciate it as always. And we'll talk here soon. Lots of love, my man. And thanks everyone for being here. Speak soon. Bye.